Welcome to Veggie Happenings in June 2022. Um, I, we're going to just chat a bit before we get everybody in. And Tommy, if you could just let me know when we have, you know, when, when it looks like we're, where everybody's in. So uh, thank you for, thank you for coming. And we hope we have uh, exactly what you're looking for today. And some of these uh, issues will be like the tomato horn worms. Maybe you don't have them right now, but you probably will. So um, we'll get you all ready for that ahead of time. We just wanted to remind you too that this is the best science-based information that we have at this point. So if you are looking at this as a recording off of YouTube um, and the date is considerably past June 2022, you might want to just keep that in mind. So this is the best information we have for you right now. And let's see, we're going to talk to you about peppers in your summer garden. And some of you have probably already uh, planted your peppers, but you can still plant peppers. And Elaine Walter is going to talk to you about that. Um, Kitty Ritz is going to talk to you about water monitors and uh, really some interesting things that you can do to make sure your plants are getting the right amount of water. And then master food preservers are going to teach you um, how to do fruit, make fruit leather and not just any fruit leather, but tie dye fruit leather. Okay, so Tommy, we okay now to get started? Yeah, I think you should go. Okay. Great. All right. So, uh, and the, these are the presenters. I put Kathleen twice because she is actually doing two things for us. She wears many hats in our organizations. And um, there is a lovely tomato worm. And by the end of this, she'll, you'll be able to know what kind of tomato worm that is. So your audio and video will be off for this webinar. And please use the Q&A box for questions. So uh, not the chat the Q&A box. And this Zoom talk is being recorded so that you can watch it later because, you know, lots of times you go through and think, hmm, I sort of remember what they were talking about, but you need more specifics. So feel free to go back on uh, Sonoma County Master Gardeners YouTube and just type in Veggie Happenings June 2022 and it'll come right up. So here are some resources for you. You can go to, and I will have a QR code up at the end. So if you have your phone nearby, that will be helpful. So we have a fabulous Sonoma County Master Gardener website and lots and lots and lots of information. Keep you busy forever. Um, and if you want just food gardening, there is a tab at the top that says food gardening and just go in and uh, select us from the drop down menu. And you can also go through and find food gardening with less water on the drop down because obviously we're in this drought and we need to save water and we want our vegetables to grow. So we have a new sustainability wheel. It's basically the same. We've just um, modified it a bit. So first of all, most important um, is to conserve and protect water right now for us because you know we haven't had water. Well, we had a little bit of water here um, uh, end of last month, but um, we wanna make sure we use it well. Put the right plant in the right place at the right time. So it's still the right time to plant peppers. That's why we're telling you about that. Nurture and protect your soil. So the soil is where all this life is coming from and where all our good nutrition is. So make sure you take care of your soil and don't ask too much of it and give it a little something back. So practice integrated pest management. Make sure that um, you, you're knowing the difference between good and bad bugs and that um, bad bugs aren't really bad, that uh, they just might not be great for your garden where they are. And you wanna make sure that you deal with them in a sustainable way. We want to protect and encourage wildlife and not just shut them out. We want to conserve energy also. Very important this time of year. Okay, so Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr, who is a, an IPM specialist, integrated pest management, along with being a food gardening specialist, is going to tell you about 
these visitors tomato and tobacco corn rooms, worms that you may find in your garden. Okay, Kathleen, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today I'll be speaking about a most unwelcome guest uh, in our summer vegetable gardens. Next slide, please. Sorry, Kathleen. There we go. There we go. So, first of all, hornworms are a common insect invader of home gardens. The tomato and tobacco hornworms feed only on solanaceous plants. Those are plants in the nightshade family, most typically tomato and less frequently eggplant, pepper, and potato. In their adult moth stage, they're relatively harmless in your garden. However, in the larval stage, they can be quite damaging. Uh, both species have a large horn on the posterior end of the body. The tobacco hornworm has seven diagonal stripes. And the tomato hornworm, which is on the left here, has eight chevron shaped stripes. Next slide, please. So in this frame, you can see the life cycle. Um, tomato hornworms overwinter as pupa, which is the stage between the larva and the adult in the soil. And you can see that at uh, eight o'clock in this slide. They become most active in mid to late summer. Hornworm, hornworm eggs are laid singly on the lower leaf surfaces. They're round to oval. 1.5 millimeters, and they're a white to light green color. They hatch quickly, usually within four to five days. Upon hatching, the larva immediately begin to feed, continually for about a month, before dropping to the ground to pupate. They are most active in mid to late summer. Next slide, please. As you can see, they are large, heavy-bodied hawk moths with a wingspan up to actually five inches. They can be mistaken for hummingbirds because of their large size, the rapid wings, beats, and their quick movements. Next slide, slide please. So you can see the damage that can be created in the garden. Um, Primarily, they feed on the leaves, but as you can see in the picture on the left, they will attack the fruit as well. They can devour up to four times their weight in leaves and fruit each day, and if left unchecked, they will defoliate the plant. Next slide, please. So how to control them? Obviously, frequent inspection. Pick them off and then put them into soapy water to kill them. Go out at night and use a black light headlamp. The hornworms glow green under the black light and make them much easier to find. One sign that your plants have an infestation is to see small black droppings called frass left behind on the lower plant leaves. And next slide, please. So what's the best way to control them? Uh, plant insectary plants, and these are grown to attract, feed, and shelter insect predators and parasites to enhance biological pest control. Insects such as lady beetles, green lice swings, um, and some predatory wasps will eat the hornworm eggs and smaller larvae. The rachnoid wasp lays its eggs on larger hornworm caterpillars. You'll see them appear as cigar-like projections, and you can see that on the lower left. Um, if you see them, keep them there, because cigars that you are actually seeing are the cocoons of the brachnoid wasps. Mm. And then on the right, the tiny parasitic trichogramma wasp, it lays its eggs in the tomato hornworm egg, which in turn parasitizes the egg and kills it. So remember, hornworms are among the largest caterpillars you're gonna see in your garden. They measure up to four to five inches in length. 
which makes them easy to control. Go out at night, wear that headlamp, and be in business. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And they they blend in so well. You have to. I look for the frass and then look up and oh, they're right there. So if you have chickens, give them to your chickens. They love them. Okay, now Elaine Walter, uh, food gardening specialist, and um, she's a major volunteer at Harvest for the Hungry Garden in um, Santa Rosa. Uh, and she grows lots and lots of peppers. So she's gonna talk to us about growing peppers this time of year in Sonoma County. So Elaine, it's all yours. Mute, unmute. Hi, um, I'm Elaine Walter and I do grow a lot of peppers and they asked me to tell you the really essential things that you need to know about peppers right now. So the question is, can you grow peppers in Sonoma County? The answer is yes. The major question is, is it too late to grow peppers in Sonoma County? And the answer is no. And finally, the last question is, can you still find pepper starts in Sonoma County in nurseries and big box stores? And as of last week, at least, the answer was an emphatic yes. So why would you grow peppers in your garden? Well, first of all, peppers are beautiful. They work well as a landscape plant. They used to sell peppers as ornamentals. It used to be Christmas peppers instead of, uh, instead of other plants were sold at Christmas time just because of the beautiful fruit and ornamentals. They're easy to grow and they're easy to grow in a drought. They're fun to eat. And most importantly, I think for myself and my family, they're healthy. Peppers that you buy in the store need to be organic if you believe that you should uh, buy organic when the plant is on the dirty dozen. So peppers are a number, I think, six or seven on the dirty dozen. You should buy organic if you can't grow them at home. If you can grow them at home, you can grow them organically. Next. So they also make wonderful container plants, and this is uh, the second Obviously, this is where somebody's growing it in a utilitarian way, and that's fine. The plant, the pots need to be eight inch deep. And the other one is from uh, Rosalind Creasy, I believe, one of her books. And of course, she's done a beautiful display with peppers and other plants as well in the same container. And I hope I remember to tell you a few different tips about adjustments you need to make when you grow in containers. Next. So peppers are extremely healthy. They're rich in vitamin A and C and antioxidants. But if you can, wait for green peppers to mature and they'll be even healthier when they're red, yellow, or orange for maximum health benefits. Next. So the question that you would ask earlier in the year, not so much now, is should you use seeds or starts? First of all, you should know that you can never direct seed peppers in Sonoma County, it's not practical. In other words, you can't put the seeds directly in the ground. But if you want to create your own starts, you can start growing your seeds in late January if they're really hot peppers or early February. Obviously, it's too late to do that now. Um, peppers are a little trickier to grow because they don't all germinate at the exact same time. So you have to, the conditions are a little more special. So the other alternative and the only alternative right now is to purchase your starts from a reliable source. Next. So using purchased starts, as I said, is the only choice now. Sometimes there's a lack of variety and I must say there's a small lack of variety now, although there's still things available. I do want to mention that if you're out there shopping for pepper starts, I would avoid the really hot peppers unless you have plans for overwintering peppers and that's a whole other topic. But the really hot peppers will need more days to maturity than, than we would have at this point. But other green peppers, the sweet peppers, fine. Or even the jalapenos, the hot peppers that are eaten green like jalapenos, it's not too late to plant them. When you buy starts, sometimes starts are forced and they might have too much nitrogen um, and therefore they'll be tall and thin. Uh, the starts could be root bound. Um, we don't have to worry about the starts being sold too early, but we do have to tell you that some of the starts that you buy now may have lived their life in a hot house and not been exposed to the outside. So I know it's hard to wait to plant them, but you might want to gradually harden them off by exposing them to real sunlight over a two or three day period, a few hours. Uh, I just wanted to say you're not going to find perfect uh, starts necessarily now. I would not uh, eliminate the possibility of planting peppers. Obviously, if the plants are a little root bound, you're going to loosen them up at the roots. If they look a little too tall, they'll still leaf out. Notice that this one may have been too tall, but notice how it's sending out second leaves. So you not you may not find perfect starts this late in the year, but they will grow. You don't 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 hold out for perfection. 
Okay, if we paid attention to the books about peppers, we would never grow peppers in Sonoma County because they tell us what the ideal averages are. So we need uh, nighttime temperatures of 55 to 75 degrees. I please, I don't want those many degrees at night around here. The soil temperature should be 65 degrees four inches below the surface. As you can see, at least traditionally, prior to global warming, we never meet that condition in Santa Rosa. Nevertheless, we grow great peppers here. Next. The daytime temperature also is not necessarily need to be ideal, but the ideal temperature would be 70 to 80 degrees, a warm, spuddy, sunny spot for six to eight hours. I'd love to get some afternoon shade on my plants because it protects the, the fruit from sun scald. But again, there's some variation here. Uh, peppers will stand a little bit more shade than tomatoes. So if you have a place that maybe only has five and a half hours of sun, I've grown them in places where they get a little more shade and I still get peppers. Not as many as if they were later, but next. So this, I, I'm going to really skim over this because obviously we don't have to worry at this time of year about warming the soil, covering the plant, planting in containers. Um, if, we were, if we were buying our starts earlier, in the year, I would tell you to plant them in a larger container and wait, but we don't have to do that now. It is interesting, though, that this practice of covering plants to warm up the soil also works in a hailstorm, as we had a few weeks back. So my friend rushed out and covered her peppers, much as much as is shown in this picture here, and her peppers survived and her tomatoes did not in that horrible hail that we had about three weeks ago. Next. So if you have a small yard, you have what I call the Solanaceae dilemma, and that is that Many of our garden plants belong to the same family, the Solanaceae family. So the best practice for Solanaceae, Solanaceae is to rotate them every three years. And that doesn't mean rotate the peppers every three years. It means if you plant tomatoes in a bed, you should not plant peppers there the subsequent year, et cetera, et cetera. You should be considering potatoes, eggplant, uh, peppers, and uh, tomatoes all in the same Solanaceae family. But uh, we, don't, we can't always follow the best practices, so we need to just manage our soil, pay attention to the disease conditions that I've never seen exist for my peppers. And you can also uh, grow peppers, of course, in containers. Next. Okay, I'm going to tell you how to prepare the soil ideally, and I know you won't all have the opportunity to use as much compost as I do. But I would say raised beds are ideal for peppers because they need good drainage. And if they are overwatered and don't have good drainage, the soil will, the, the roots will rot. Something to keep in mind if you are growing in a container, don't overwater. Anyway, I keep my soil covered in the winter, which helps to manage any potential diseases. And then when, uh, when the uh, winter is over, I, I remove what, I cover it with cardboard and compost. And then I add more compost. I compost, compost, and compost. Next. So here's how I plant peppers. I Dig a hole, I dig a hole a little deeper and wider than the pot. It doesn't have to be huge because we're not into disturbing soil anymore. I do add compost to the hole and I water it in. I want you to know that you can space peppers on the closer to the minimum range if you want to. So I, I space mine as close as possible because I like them to kind of help each other out with shade and water. Um, so you can you can space them 12 inches apart. If you're planning on doing intercropping in the fall and you want to plant a cabbage between them, then you're going to need to put them further apart. But ordinarily, I think planting them together closer is better than farther. Then I add an organic fertilizer, and sometimes I add bone meal. I used to add um, uh, eggshells because I wanted to make sure it was available for calcium, but I realized that took a long time to become available. So now I add bone meal, and I loosen the roots and I bury to the same level as in the pot. And then after I water it in, I check to make sure that I don't have any roots exposed because sometimes burying at the same level as in the pot is a little tricky. You think you've buried it and you haven't, but you do not want to bury it deep. Next. Peppers need support. So it's before the peppers get too big, not necessarily the same day, but sooner than, sooner than later, you should think about putting the stakes in. This, this is actually the exact kind of staking that I use, but you can use small tomato cages. You can use single stakes. They do need some support, uh, but you want to make sure that the support has holes big enough for you to get in and, and harvest the peppers. So when I do this, I take the little plant tag out and I punch a hole through the uh, plant tag with a hole punch and I tie it onto the cage so I can easily see what variety of pepper I'm harvesting. 
Next. So this was a picture from my own garden about uh, a week or so ago. And uh, it's a little further planted along now, but this is how I start to mulch my, before I put down any other mulch, I plant uh, um, alyssum plants. But obviously the standard way that you mulch is with straw or leaves or wood chips. That's my least favorite method, or just simply more compost. You wanna cover that soil and keep it moist. Um, you're gonna continue to weed if you need to. You are going to water deeply. And I actually uh, doubted that this was right, but I just reread it. Pepper roots do go down four feet. And uh, so you don't, that doesn't mean you need to water four feet though. Um, you can, if you've watered, as I described in the planting process, there's water down there already. Um, pepper plants probably derive most of the water that they need in the first eight inches. Don't water too often. And some sources, most sources say pepper plants need one inch of water per week. Some other sources say they need two inches of water per week. Why the difference? Because there are so many different conditions in water in uh, gardens. So some gardens like mine have clay soil and we don't probably don't have to water as often. We don't have to water as often as people with sandy soil, but I'm a very dry climate. I'm not humid. I don't have a lot of rainfall. So just pay attention to the conditions in your garden to decide how often you need to water and how much you need to water. Keeping in mind that overwatering is a really bad thing with peppers. Next. Okay, continued hair and care and harvesting. Um, so blossom end rot is a problem. And you notice I haven't said much about fertilizing here. So I wanna say that fertilizing like watering is kind of a matter, a discretionary matter as far as I'm concerned. If you planted the peppers exactly as I described, you really don't need to fertilize more, but you may want to because you wanna make sure that your peppers have enough leaf coverage on them to shade the fruit from the sun. So sometimes I water a little bit more when blossoms are about to emerge to make sure that there's enough leaves on my plant that I'm not going to get blossom end rot. It's where the flesh kind of turns white. Um, but I could use shade cloth. If it got more than 100 degrees, I would definitely plop shade cloth down on top of my peppers. Sucking insects, the main sucking insect that we, two of the main ones we've had is uh, green aphids. They seem to have gone away for the season, but maybe they're still out there. And uh, spider mites, um, keep your eyes open. And if you see them, those things can be washed off or removed with insecticidal soap. Harvest continuously if possible, um, because you'll get more peppers that way if you keep harvesting. Um, and harvest with scissors or a knife because you don't, you don't want to pull on the plant. You need to remove the, the fruit gently and concisely with a sharp instrument. Next. I think that's it, actually. That's it. So, that's great. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you. And, and so she is an absolute wealth of information. And I'm sure that if you haven't heard her speak, or even if you had, you're trying to write things down. Remember, this can be found on YouTube, um, probably tomorrow, Sonoma County Master Gardeners. So, and the other thing is, if you want to work with somebody like Elaine and take her class, you don't even, it, it's free. She works at Harvest for the Hungry, volunteers at Harvest for the Hungry. And um, if you're interested in coming and learning about gardening and helping in the garden, um, check out uh, Harvest for the Hungry, harvestgarden.org. And we'd love to have you there. It's um, Master Gardeners work there on Wednesdays. Elaine works even more than that. So now we have Kitty Ritz up and Kitty Ritz is um, our, our expert on water saving devices and other little doohickeys. She's taught us about a lot of different tools. So Kitty, tell us about how we can help save water. I apologize if any extraneous <laughs> noises come in because I am outside and there's a lot of activity. So let's talk about how to save water. Next slide. We know that every drop counts and we need to be so wise about our water. And I'm assuming, as Elaine has already prepped you for, that you have already planned for the drought because you've added lots of organic matter to your soil and that improves its ability to hold water 
you've mulched so that your water doesn't evaporate immediately. You've also had to get a grip on what you grow. You've limited the size of your garden to just what you actually like to eat. And hopefully you've installed drip irrigation. Next. But we know it's not a perfect world. So if you are growing in containers, you're probably hand watering them. If you're at a community garden, they probably won't let you use drip. If you have all these things in place, but you're still not sure if your settings on your drip are correct, and you want to know if there's a particular time in the life cycle of the plants in your garden when you can use less water. So let's look at the gadgets. We know that vegetables are not low water plants. That doesn't mean that we don't grow food. What it does mean is that you have to be aware that your veggies need you to survive and they need approximately one inch of water per week to replace the water that's lost from the soil, both by the plant transpirating and by evaporation. Now that one inch of water equals two thirds of a gallon per week per square foot of soil. So think about that pepper plant, that's a square foot of soil. And that is best applied daily so that your soil is consistently moist in the active root zone. Now how much, how often depends on your particular soil and you know Sonoma County, we have microclimates galore. Sometimes we have hail and sometimes we have 100 degrees. Next. So it's the root zone we're talking about. If you're growing lettuce, shallower roots. Doesn't worry too much about the deeper water. Seeds, very, very shallow. Watering consistently, probably daily, and covering. Most veggies need the water until the fruit is set. The fruit is the tomato, the cucumber, and then you can usually reduce watering. And if you can't water more, give your plants shade. You can plan for that by using shade cloth or you can put your plants, the shorter plants underneath taller plants, remembering how the sun travels. So these are my, my gizmos. They are called water meters. They um, measure the moisture in the soil by using some sort of probe. And that's just a, a special metal stick that's attached to a little, um, a, a little graphic a representation that goes from dry to wet. So we want to be in the middle zone. And it's easy to tell because usually it's right in the, the yellow range. So usually dry is red, green is too wet. And where do you put it? You put it, if you look in the, on the left-hand side, there's my quarter inch inline drip. I put it right next to the emitter. I want to see what's coming out of that emitter. And you can use your finger, yes, but your finger is at least mine, is not six to eight inches long. These probes can get pretty long. No moisture meter, use a chopstick. It's just like a dipstick. You stick it in, you pull it out. Is it wet? Next. And if you're hand watering with a hose, with a turnoff nozzle, of course, a meter on the hose can tell you how much water you're actually using. Now, this particular one will tell you over time. So if you use this hose to water for a whole week period, it will tell you how many uh, gallons for an entire period, plus how many for each watering. I think that's pretty helpful. I like this because it's based on an old, old technique. It's actively uh, watering the root zone using terracotta. So long ago, people in North Africa would take clay pots and bury them where they wanted to grow food. And that was called an oya. They would put the water right into the terracotta pot, cover the top, and 
the plants would, the roots of the plants would approach the terracotta because there's an osmosis effect through terracotta. Notice I'm not sticking a plastic tube into the pot. You can find those, but it's not the same principle. The idea is you soak the terracotta first, you make sure the soil is already watered. And when you stick the terracotta in, the water can travel through the terracotta from a bottle that you stick in on top. And the roots will grow towards that water. Next. And that's it. Thanks. That's great. So she's got some really good ideas there and feel free to put any questions in the chat or you can ask them as we go on. Okay, so now we're on to Master Food Preservers. And Master Food Preservers are a um, UC program. And our mission is to keep Californians safe and well as they use culturally appropriate research-based practices to safely preserve food in the home, reducing food waste, increasing food security, and providing engaging ways for Californians to explore healthy food. So we are also extremely science-based. So today we have Master Food Preserver Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr, who's going to show you how to make her famous tie-dye fruit leather. So it's my pleasure to show you today uh, one of my favorite uh, dehydrating recipes that I share with my grandchildren. Um, the recipe that I actually uh, took this from is uh, from Off the Grid, and um, it's tie-dye mango strawberry fruit leather. This, this particular recipe uses frozen fruit, both mango and strawberries. But since both of those fruits are in season right now, I'd rather use, I need that. Um, I, I'd rather use the, the um, fresh. So mangoes, they originally came from Southeast Asia. Here in California, they're grown pretty much all year round, some variety or other. This one here is called the champagne um, mango, also known as El Topo. And uh, generally they come from Mexico and they're quite, uh, they're incredibly smooth, uh, sweet and aromatic. And right now the room smells of mango. And then what a lot of people most mo commonly see is one that is red and green like this. And there can be a Kent, a Keat. Um, there's a number of different varieties and they tend to be available all year round. So I like that. And also strawberries. So we used a fresh strawberry. So to get started, first we, um, we disinfected the workspace and clean apron, secure back, wash hands, so all of that has been done. Um, the fruit has been scrubbed under cold running water. So I did that with that and, and also rinsed my strawberries under cold running water and patted them dry. Um, and a lot of my preparation for this I did ahead of time simply because of the time issue. So I started out with my blender and I put in about two to maybe two and a half cups of mango pulp, or mango uh, diced and, um, and pureed that, which is what I have here in this container. To that, I added about a, a teaspoon of, of uh, lemon juice and that keeps it from darkening. And then about um, half, quarter to a half cup of either honey or Agave. I use this for kids and I use this one more for adults. So that was uh, pureed and I poured into this container which makes travel a lot easier, also pouring quite easy. Then I rinse out the blender because now I'm going to do the strawberries and one of the tricks that I use to remove the pith and the green cap is, if you can see, I pass this, I have a reusable straw, and I pass this through the bottom of the strawberry and up 
into the top green. Sometimes it takes more than one time, but you can see it removes the pith as well as the cap. So these then I dehydrate. Um, one thing I want to go back to is prepping the um, mango. So you'll notice on the mango, there's this dimple here and you will set the mango on its end and you're gonna cut the cheeks off both sides, which I have done here. So here is one cheek that's been cut. And from there, what I do is, and you can see it, I have cut in both directions to the actual um, skin. And then this makes it much easier to remove and put into your blender. You just scrape it off with a knife. Okay, so going back now to my strawberries, I puree them and, um, oh, and if either of these solutions seem a little bit, uh, that, that doesn't have enough moisture, I add a little bit of water, a couple of tablespoons. So with the strawberries, for dietary reasons, or if you're going to, uh, in my case, I, I mix the strawberry puree with a uh, banana for my granddaughter, who's six months. Um, I pour it from the blender into this fine mesh sieve, and then I just slowly, it takes some time to get rid of, um, to, to actually have it flow to the bottom, also at the bottom here. And what you end up with then, the seeds are removed. And this is good, like if you're on a special diet, Nancy's gonna get this closer so you can see. Every, um, every strawberry has about 200 of these little seeds on the exterior. And so if you, for dietary reasons, need to stay away from seeds, this is a way to do it. You might also want to do it with raspberries. Okay, so I have my two purees ready. And, and you use the bottom part, the puree, the puree that's gone through. It. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so now I'm going to prep for my fruit leather. And mind you, you can do this with just about any fruit, but my kids tend to like this. They, they call it a throwback to my hippie days. So they especially like it. So to start this process, I'm gonna take the cap off of this and, oh yes, before I did this, I sprayed with coconut oil, a thin layer. Okay, so this makes it easy to pour. So here's my coconut oil. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I spray this um, all around a light, very light leather layer. And um, so here with the mango, I can spread it. You want it to be about an eighth of an inch thick. And to keep it from taking up too much time, I'm gonna stop with that. Now I'll take my puree from strawberry and I make an inner circle. And taking my high-tech tool here. Wait, 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 wait. Show, them, show them before. Show, the magic is about to happen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to take my fork and I'm just going to make zigzags. It's really pretty. And so here is, the, mm. it's probably going to fall off, but <laughs> could we see one of the finished yeah. ones? So again, to save time, I did a lot of the prep ahead of time. Here's what it looks like when it is finished. Mm. 
and the smell is awesome. I'll, I'll vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'm going to put it in my dehydrator, my particular dehydrator. I'll just do it up, just like this. Right now. So my dehydrator has the heating element and fan at the top. So what I'll be doing is these take about six to eight hours to dry. And since the heat's coming from the top, if you're doing multiple trays, you're going to rotate them uh, during that time. So I'd say every two hours, uh, go ahead and rotate them. And uh, so then you've already seen the finished product. Um, so then I remove the finished product from the tray. And oftentimes I'll use this type of spatula to lift a jet. And you want to remove it while it's still warm, if possible, because um, as it dries, it gets more brittle and it's not as easy. But I went ahead and removed uh, and cut, and I use a pizza, nut, pizza cutter here somewhere to cut it. Um, and then I put it on these squares. Well, that one doesn't work. I put them on squares of plastic, plastic wrap. And then I just take them and I roll them up. So parchment would work for that as well? The parchment would work. Wax paper, would that work? Um, well, this is like wax paper, uh, yeah. And then what I like to do, especially if I'm gonna give them as gifts, I have these little decorative tapes and I, like this, and that's how I give them to my grandchildren. They think they're pretty. These will last um, for a period, if they do last, um, they can be eaten within a month. Um, but for longer term, you can freeze them for up to a year. And um, they're, they're delicious. They don't have any of the preservatives in them that um, store-bought fruit leather has. And uh, I guarantee you that They'll be eaten. So, <laughs> so Kathleen, can you reduce the sugar at all? Yes, you could. I mean, you don't even have to, to add one of these, depending on your own. Your, I do not use sugar because it tends to crystallize. Another additive that's sometimes used is corn syrup, but it gives an off taste. So uh, if you are going to use a sweetener, use one of these. So Kathleen, what are some other fruits that you could, you know, make the fruit leather out of? Oh my, anything that you can puree. So okay. You can add, um, you can use a combination of applesauce, which is easily poured and, mm -hmm. um, and add another fruit to that, make mango, papaya. Um, and, and also you can dehydrate anything that's in season. Um, you know, I, I dehydrate pineapple. Uh, let's see what else. I kiwi, and I love the golden kiwi. They're so pretty when they're dehydrated. Um, and do you, do you uh, tend to add the lemon juice to all of the different fruits? If you're going to make, yes. If, if it's going to discolor, then I would. Or citric acid. One okay. Of the, yeah. Okay. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Certainly. You know, we have so many great resources and we have a wonderful uh, Sonoma County Master Food Preserver, Preserver Facebook page. And the QR code that I'm gonna show you here in a minute, will go right there so you can get those recipes. And there's um, a, a website, a Facebook page. The, the QR code goes to the website. Kathleen is the one that goes through and maintains the Facebook page and she puts lots of incredible recipes and really timely information there. Really great to check out if you're on Facebook. And then um, California Master Food Preservers have a fabulous website as well. And So Easy to Preserve is one of the, um, is the main book that we use with all tested uh, recipes in them. So I have to say, people had asked before about um, our upcoming presentations. So we have a, um, their, Sonoma County is doing a zero waste week at the end of July. And where the whole county is working together to try to reduce especially food waste, which fits right into Master Food Preservers. 
So we're going to do two presentations for you. One is called Food Scraps into Food and using up all the little bits and pieces of things that you have left over that you might not always use. And it's on July 27th, which is a Wednesday. It's a drop-in. So that's from 6 to 8 p.m. And both of these are at Sonoma Queen Powers Advanced Energy Center. And they're letting us use this fabulous kitchen area with these wonderful induction stoves. And so um, come, if you haven't been in, you need to be, come in anyways, but drop in at the farmer's market and then come on by between six and eight and we'll show you what you can do with the little leftover pieces that you have after what, whatever you've bought at the farmer's market. Then on um, July 30th, which is a Saturday, we're going to do a, um, a webinar on canning tomatoes. Right about that time is about the time you're gonna start really getting a bunch of tomatoes in and you're gonna say, what am I gonna do with these? So we're gonna show you, that's from one to three. That one you do need to sign up to reserve a spot. And that information will be on our website as well as uh, Zero Waste Weeks. Um, and like I said, if you haven't been to Sonoma Clean Power Advanced Energy Center, amazing, really amazing. If you need help with um, food preservation, you're getting started into something or you want to get started and you've Googled things, you've looked at our website, you still have information or you, you need information, then go ahead and um, email us or send, um, call us and it's a recording and we will get back to you as to some um, science-based information that will answer your questions. And uh, okay, here are some other resources if you don't uh, have a QR reader on your phone. And we will have, it's coming up. Okay, there's our QR code for um, Master Food Preservers. So if you capture that with your phone, uh, the recipes are up already. I already printed them out myself um, for the fruit leather. And it, here is the QR code for uh, Master Gardeners. And that will give you all of the uh, resources that um, Elaine and Kitty have, uh, and Kathleen have put in there on the topics that we did today. Okay, so let's see. We really wanna thank you for being here. I'm going to, let's see, escape. All right, and I think, Okay, I don't think we have any questions at this point. Is If anybody wants to unmute, anybody else have anything else to add? Any of our presenters? I didn't, uh, this is Elaine. I didn't really address the issue of containers. So since I have a couple of minutes, I'll just go ahead and do that. Go for so it. Um, if you're raising your peppers in containers, you really need to worry about keeping enough water on them. And you, as I said before, you need an eight inch pot and you are going to need to fertilize, uh, regardless of uh, you know, what the schedule would be if it was in the ground, because they will use up the nutrients. So let's say you use a nutrient rich potting soil to plant your plants in, you will need to probably at least every three weeks put some uh, maybe diluted fish emulsion or, and I wouldn't even worry too much about whether it's organic or not, but some kind of fertilizer, mild fertilizer on your con container plants. And of course, don't plant, don't put your container where it's going to get totally hot sun because the, you know, it's quite hot here in the summer. So it'd be a good idea to put it in a, maybe where it gets morning sun and afternoon shade. So again, if you're going to grow in containers, take a quicker look. And if you're planning, if you're, if you want to over pepper your, over winter your peppers, we have a video on that on our um, Master Gardener website. So. Yes. And, and we went through and we did a follow-up video also. And Elaine has, is always reading and learning something new. And um, we tried overwintering and we had a, a few little pitfalls, um, aphids mainly, both of us. And one thing that I was gonna say, Elaine, is some of mine that got the aphids, probably they had too much nitrogen. So they ended up getting pretty tall. And you know, I those suckers were, were really persistent and but I went ahead and planted two of the overwinter ones and they look good now and but my my seedlings that were out there got hit really hard with the aphids and all I did was after I washed off those leaves several times 
Then I finally got them out of the greenhouse. So when we had talked about because where the ladybugs and the other things that would eat those, those aphids could get to them. Um, and, you know, there were a couple that were just, they looked horrible at the top. And I just snipped that top right off. And you know what? They're doing great. <laughs> they well, just keep growing. That's a whole other topic. You know, if I, was, if I had more than just a few minutes to talk about peppers, but one of the big disputes in pepper growing is, do you top them off? Or do you not top them off? Because a lot of people believe you should cut the top off peppers and that you'll get more production that way. That's a, a whole 15 huh. minutes. Okay, well, I didn't even know that PC. You learn something new every day. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so anybody else have anything to add? Kitty, anything else? And we really appreciate everybody sticking through. We did not get in the PD this month, the Press Democrat. Um, and we know that there are the, the, the Senate hearings are, are going on right now, and we appreciate you going through and listening to us first and then going to that second. So, um, can The you only thing I would add is um, if you haven't checked our website, Master Gardener website, for all the resources on water wise gardening especially for vegetables. There is so much information available there. It's very valuable and I strongly recommend you check out our website. Excellent, that's great, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. We, oh, and hold on, hold on. I have a couple of, let me just make sure. Um, okay, so Elaine, here's a good one for you. Is it okay to prune tomato plants? When would you do this? It depends on what you mean by pruning tomato plants. Do you mean there's different, I, we always prune them from the bottom at Harvest for the Hungry Garden. We don't want any tomato branches touching the ground and assuming your tomatoes should be big enough now that you go ahead and cut off all those lower branches that are touching the ground. So that's one method of pruning. Another reason that people prune is some people feel that they get more fruit or bigger, not more fruit, but bigger fruit if they go ahead and pinch off. And I don't know, maybe you can see me here, but here's, here's, two branch, tomato branches coming out and here's a little third branch coming out. A lot of people come and cut off that third branch, right? That third little sprout. And I never do that, but um, you could do that. Some people wanna prune their tomatoes for size and especially at the end of the season, they wanna prune their tomatoes to make sure that they keep producing. And obviously at the end, they're mainly producing leaves and you're not gonna get fruit anyway. So they come when the, fruit, when the plants get maybe eight foot tall, they, they give them a little haircut at the top. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but you can, you know, tomatoes are incredibly hardy, so you can whack them off whenever you need to. Maybe to get airflow going, they'll, they'll come back, yeah. Exactly, and you know, you can even, if you, for some reason, have lost a tomato plant, you can even take a cutting, take one of those little suckers and root it and put it in the ground and it'll grow. You just have to think about, you know, do you have enough days to maturity to get, so that you can get tomatoes off of those actually, so but I always do prune the tops, you know, when you get near the end of the season, you know, the middle of September, you know, a lot of those big tomatoes that are on there, just finish, don't give me more tomatoes. So I trim the, trim the top off, but you want to make sure that, you know, you don't, you don't prune them down so much that you're going to have issues with sun scald. Um, okay, so another comment was when the temperature reaches three digits in July and August, blossoms and fruit tend to drop. Yeah, and so that's one of the advantages of peppers is you can cover a pepper plant with shade cloth <laughs> yeah. and reduce the effect of that. So yeah, and you can also do it with tomatoes, but it's obviously peppers are easier because they're not so big. That's right. And boy, that shade, giving it a little bit of shade sure helps with the uh, you know, getting it through those super hot days, boy. And, you know, I put chairs over the top sometime if I have some odd thing that's just really suffering, but getting them ahead of time before they really do, you know, have a problem, so. You can also use patio umbrellas. You can, yeah. you can move them right over the garden. Exactly. Shade makes a big difference, you know, anything, really anything, as long as you've got airflow underneath, it's fine, yeah. That's great, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us and um, have a great day.